<laughs> so you can be quiet. <laughs> the longest. That's what I do for my kids with our quiet game. One, two, three, quiet game. Okay. Whoever can go the longest without. How's the way? Wins. We're back with episode 759 of Big Hunt Guys podcast. Dang, we've been doing this for a while. Man, so we are crank- we're turning them. Turning and burning. Churning and burning. We're back in the Stone Glacier tent. And through the feedback that we received from our listeners, people enjoyed the podcast post Go Hunt original film to kind of go in depth on what went on in the film. So today we're going to be talking about Brady's film that was just released, One More Ridge. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's on YouTube channel. We're also doing a giveaway for that, so be sure to check out the giveaway in the description. We're going to dive into Brady's Idaho deer hunt. But e- everything Brady. Everything Brady, everything mule deer. I don't, even know, I don't even know if that was the right state. Brady, will, we'll never know where he was hunting. A state in the west. Is it in the west, though? <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's in the west. If yeah. people don't know yet, Brady hates talking about his spots. He hates even Absol- mentioning the state that he was hunting in. Absolutely drives me crazy. My goal is to get him to, get him to, to say something. I mean, a, the title is it. One More Ridge in Idaho Deer Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Done for. Uh, Busted, Brady. I'm going to walk out right now. I think we should first start off with, how was it getting your Idaho deer tag? Oh, my gosh. We actually have a YouTube video on this, too. This was an old What's Bugging Brady. So this would have been in 20... This was 20 20. 20 where you had to pick up the tag for yeah, last year. Yeah, because you get them in December. Brady yeah. got a lot of hate for that video, didn't he? This is this, I do. This <laughs> was the re- residents don't like me. What's Bugging Brady? When you yeah. when you talk about Idaho's system, yeah. So this was the first year that they had this new system. Yep. Tell yep. us tell us a little about that that process. I mean, we're all we're all in that process, but yeah. So it was a little fiasco. I mean, they had their you know you always had tags always went on sale on December first, but normally they didn't sell out. And this was the first year they actually had individual quotas for non residents for deer in. I guess we're saying it's the state of Idaho because. We're talking about Idaho. It's an so, Idaho deer Okay, hunt. so I got to talk about Idaho now. <laughs> and so those tags went on sale. What they go on sale? Like it's 9 o'clock our time. It was like 10 o'clock your time trail. Yeah. So it's to go on sale in the morning on December 1st, and you basically can log in early. It doesn't really matter if, how early you log in. You're eventually going to be put into a waiting room, basically right. a queue, and you'll get a randomized number, and then they start going off that random number for your, those person to pick up tags. And so we all got screwed royally. And just get random numbers that are crazy high. I, I remember thinking, because none of us had any clue what this process was going to look like. I remember thinking, like, all right, if we get an hour early, once we get in the queue, we're going to be further along sure. in the line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then, we, case. then we come to find out. It's random. It yeah, doesn't we, matter. We, we, we even had people say, oh, you guys are liars. Like, you. you like if you would have logged in earlier, you got a better number. Like we logged in way early, did not get a better number. We've had guys at the office who logged in three minutes beforehand, and they got a better number than we did. Yeah. It's totally random, and yeah. So then you get put in the waiting room, and then it was I don't know what it was three hours. Didn't we wait to get oh, my tag? Yeah. What line? Do you remember what you were in? I line? was. I swear I was like thirteen thousand. I think or something I was like eleven thousand. Yeah, so I was 13,000, so I had to keep waiting, and I kept seeing little pop-ups on the screen, like, oh, some elk tags are sold out, some deer units are starting to sell out, and I was, like, freaking out, like, am I actually going to get a deer tag? Yeah. And so essentially what it does is you have to wait, you wait in line, tell your spot, and then you get, what, 10 minutes? Yep, so he's got to, yeah, that's why in the back of my mind ahead of time, I was like, I don't know how popular this is going to be, but I'm going to have a list of, you know, three mm-hmm. to five different units that I actually want to pick up a tag for. And I can't remember exactly how they determine those tag numbers for non-resident. I think it was based on your prior harvest, or not harvest, but survey data to determine, hey, these are how many tags we can give out for non-residents in every unit. Basically, what it was is to reduce non-resident competition. Yeah, and those are on a unit basis. So yep. you pick up a unit, one unit. You can only hunt one unit mm-hmm. for deer, and you can't bounce around anymore. And so it was interesting. So... Yeah, I picked up my tag in that process after being super stressed out. Did you get your first tag, the one that you wanted? No, I did not. You got? Did you get your second tag? That you I wanted? don't know if I got my second. <laughs> I don't know if I got my fifth. I got some. I got a tag. You got a tag. You guys always well, know my strategy, though. If I can pick up any sort of mule deer tag in any state, I will be happy. Mm-hmm. So it, it is still like one of my choices because I, I'm just happy with any tag. But was, have you ever even looked at this area, knew anything about this spot? Was it just like completely like? No, it wasn't I've completely. never been in here. I just want a deer tag. I'm just going to pick this one because this one's available. Yeah, I mean, I've never stepped foot, but, you know, it's going to be a good unit. 
What unit was it? <laughs> you guys are trying to dive, 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 you're trying to bait me in. <laughs> Come on. You no, know you want to. No. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a fiasco to get a permit. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the thing that I hated most, which I probably didn't do a good job explaining it, is I just felt bad for all the people who aren't able to sit near to their phone for three hours or sit mm-hmm. next to their computer for three hours. Maybe they have a construction job. Maybe they're traveling or those family members who can't apply as a party and pick up a tag. Yeah. So I talked to a lot of people like the last couple of years now, they're like, hey, we've been hunting Idaho for so long as a family camp. You know, we always hunt the same area. Now they can't do that anymore. I think that's the biggest complaint that I've, I've heard from people that I've talked to is they just didn't have the option to pick up a permit for the same unit as a buddy. You know, there's, yep. no, there's no guarantee. I mean, you and I, yeah. we've kind of lined out units that we wanted to elk hunt and we've never been able to buy the same permit for the same, mm-hmm. you know, unit or you know group of units for elk yeah and so that's about the hard part and the part that i didn't like as well we continued that same system into 2022 mm-hmm. without knowing hey where's the data behind this can we actually see some data but it's not like did that prevent overcrowding in some of these units mm. you know like everyone hates to say it but there's still a lot of resident overcrowding <laughs> Yeah, there yeah. is. I mean, there's definitely less non. There's less non-residents. I mean, yep. there, there there has to be. And, and the tag numbers are always the same. You know, mm-hmm. capped at the same number. So it's not like they gave out less tags this, this time, sure. but they were just more spread out in the numbers. So mm-hmm. just part of the process, though. I it mean, is. Yeah, you just got like I know it's not a fallback state anymore. I think a lot of people mm-hmm. are proud to say that because like they they kind of got like this stigma of yeah it's just a last resort kind of state yeah. and, and to their to their credit i mean to idaho game and fish credit i mean they're trying to address social issues that they're hearing oh, yeah. i mean from their residents their residents are saying hey it's too crowded there's too many non-residents and you know they're looking at a, a means to try to address that issue so i can't i can't fault them you know mm-hmm. it's it kind of sucks as a non-resident but at the same time i mean everything you know it changes it, it, it you, is you what just, it is you just yeah. gotta adapt and play the game and yeah the only thing like that would have made it better for me is you could apply as a party Mm-hmm. with your buddies yeah i agree it is kind of funny though every year december 1st i know that we're God, Neville. kicking That's the mic it's this one i didn't even kick anything it's, it's got to be this connector because it's still you can still hear oh there we go neville's touching stuff it's this one there we go There we go. Mic check. <laughs> this is why I always run this thing. <laughs> not, <laughs> not put it next to Neville. Yeah, watch out. Yeah, I was just saying it is kind of – it ha- has been kind of fun like the last two years, you know, December 1st. It's it's almost like, uh, you know, a, a draw deadline or – did yours just go out again? Mine went out. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. it's out. Mine's uh-huh. out. It's this cord because it's still doing fine on the recording. Where's this one? This one goes into right here. It keeps going in and out. It's back now. Just don't touch the cords, boys. We're alive. <laughs> yes, I was just saying it's uh, it, it has been fun. It's almost like a, you know a draw result kind of vibe, you mm-hmm. know, especially between the three of us. I mean, we we played the game and we're kind of checking in with each other and texting and calling. And, oh yeah, and we we're constantly on jumping Slack. on some Slack and Google Meets and it's like yeah, like what number did you get? You yeah, know, and it makes it fun. Yeah, I think. Maybe there's something to being farther north because I've been in Cedar City in my office and I've I've got a better number two years in a row than you guys okay, have. Okay, okay, look at that intel. Uh-huh. Yeah, but it's not that much better. I think I was like eh, maybe 45 minutes ahead of you guys is all. So what happens if we go to Alaska around December 1st? That means we're like we're number one for sure. Yeah, I wonder what happens if you just show up at the office up there. I know, I'm I'm, s- I'm too scared to do that. <laughs> Field trip. Field trip. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought there was a armrest over here in my chair and just like almost fell over. Yeah, yesterday Neville leaned into that one pretty yeah, heavy and, one. and about fell out of the chair. So that was, yeah. that was pretty funny. We do need some new chairs in here. We but had a bunch of Yetis, but I don't know where they all went. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. So, I mean, it is a relief though, right? That December 1st. I know that for me, like this year, I got an elk tag. I got a deer tag. You got. I got a deer tag. Oh, you did. What unit? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway. You know, you got uh, a deer, deer tag, tag. Yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it is it is great that, like, December 1st, a whole year in advance, I mean, essentially a lot of us, our hunting seasons have just wrapped. Yep, and you're <laughs> and already trying to plan instantly. De- December 1st, you're already, you know, picking up a permit and planning and, and buying and, and having one in yeah. your back pocket. It's nice knowing that I already have a deer tag. It is nice. It's very nice, and I've already started to do a bunch of maps research ahead of time, trying to figure out, hey, these are areas I've killed deer in the past. Like, where's that terrain similar to some of these other places? Like, I'm already mm-hmm. dialing in 
way ahead of time because I have so much time before all these other states had to have any apps do. So I'm yeah. like, I have a better plan going into Idaho than ever because you pick up those tags early now. Yeah, and you can, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how deep we want to go down the rabbit hole, but you can return them. So, yeah. I mean, like right now, you know, I've drawn some elk tags, which I didn't think I was going to draw. And I've still got that elk tag for Idaho, and I can turn that thing back in up until June, I think, and get like a 50% refund, which, you know, I'm going to eat some money, but at the same time, it's yeah, and it's and important like, to me, and I've got a tag in my pocket. And like I know what we all do, we all still apply for the controlled yeah. draw. So oh, if you, yeah, if you do it, if you, I do deer, so if I apply for a deer and I draw it, I'm going to probably turn my yeah. OTC tag in and yeah, convert I'll it over. I'll still apply for deer, elk, and antelope and, and hope that I pick up an even better permit. Might be another elk tag. That'd be sweet. Oh, boy. Oh boy, you guys don't need broken backs is what we would have. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So what what time of year? I mean, is it an October hunt? Yeah, October hunt. So the way I kind of since you know I guess I'm a little bit fortunate, and it was nice when the storm system was, but I try to schedule this hunt around a snowstorm because hmm. it's October. Everyone knows, or if you don't know, hunting mule deer in October is pretty tough. Mm-hmm. They strip their velvet, they're heading into the timber, they're not rutting. It's usually kind of Depending on rat, it could be warm weather. And so, like, I don't want to hunt bucks that are just timbered up and I can't see them. Do you feel like that October time frame, most of those bucks are just holed up? There's hold up in some little hell hole that you just have to find them. And mm-hmm. there's just no rhyme or reason for where they're at because a lot of the terrain can look very similar. Right. And especially with all these other states you go to, like, what, what determines a good habitat from bad habitat? Like, you only really know from boots in the ground experience once you're out there and then kind of start to figure some things out. But it's still a crapshoot a lot of times. Mm-hmm. But where to do it. So I tried to schedule it around when I knew it was going to be a big nasty snowstorm because that worked for me in years past in, in Idaho. And just so happens we got the storm I was looking for and mm-hmm. got a lot of weather. Which you, you like the snow? I love the snow. I mean, do you genuinely like hunting in the snow? Like, do you like it or do you just like the potential results? I, like of the having pot- I definitely like the potential results. The struggle that you have to go through when mm-hmm. you're in the moment is probably not as enjoyable as you know, do some good weather and yeah. can glass forever. You don't have to worry about the fog and the snow and losing visibility, but the outcome. And I think the biggest thing to me too is, is just another way to outcompete other hunters out there. Mm-hmm. I don't mean you sound like a big ass. Like I also love to like, you know, there's the competition when you're hunting. It doesn't have to be, but it's like to me that as an element of other people to be lazy, not go as far, not hunt as hard, just like, you know, maybe right. they might just n- avoid that snowstorm and go after the snowstorm. And that cause like, yeah, the whole month of October to hunt it. So it's like, mm-hmm. you don't always have to go at the same time. Yeah. And I don't think you have to look at it like a competition between you and other, other hunters per se. I mean, ultimately your goal is to be out there to be successful, right? Yep, and so you, you're going to put all the cards in my pocket that'll lead me to be successful. But I also like, I do enjoy a struggle. Like there is something to me like about me that I just enjoy a suffer fest. Yeah. To me, the more I suffer, and even if I don't have to take the biggest deer in the world, if I suffer and I'm in a really cool environment and a snowstorm, and I see a bunch of snow on that buck's back or antlers and he's bedded down, I take a, a good buck. Like that to me is a really cool story that I leave from. And that mm-hmm. almost is more valuable than the antler size. You like the aftermath of the struggle. Yeah. At least that's me. I mean, I don't know. I'm going to want to project onto you, but for me, that's Right. I like the aftermath of the struggle. When I'm in the struggle, I don't necessarily love the struggle. No. Mm-hmm. It's not till after you realize, like, okay. Yeah, that was pretty epic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's that type two fun, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, it snowed. Yeah, it snowed a shit done. <laughs> snowed prior to your hunt or right while you were there? Uh, Right, basically when we were there. And the funny thing is, is we kind of got up there a little bit late. And uh, the season was already going, but that's when the snowstorm was going to happen. And this is not on the film, but... As we're hiking up, we ran into two guys from California, and they both recognized me right away. And uh, and then I was like, "Oh yeah, how's it going, guys? See any deer?" And like, we've been up here for I think they said like two or three days. We're like, "Yeah, it's gonna suck. Like we haven't seen a freaking buck." Hmm. And they're like, yeah, "I'm sure you can find deer. Maybe you've already scouted deer, but it's letting you know, Brady. Like we haven't seen any deer at all, and we're heading out of here." Does that play in your head at all at that moment when you hear that? And the guy, somebody tells you, I've just been in here for five days and haven't seen a buck. What yeah, part, it's part of me <laughs> would be a little concerned, but also I had scouted that unit twice in the summer. So uh-huh. I've been up there twice doing summer scouting. Mm-hmm. How and long did it take you to get there, you figure? Like drive time. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> just kidding. Took me 100 <laughs> hours to get there. How did, how did you pick this spot? basically I picked a spot by taking all, like I talked about this before about that the power of our train analysis tool. Like there is a lot of power there that people I don't think realize how to unleash it. 
So on Go Hunt Maps, basically what I do is I take every single kill waypoint I've ever had from mule deer. Mm-hmm. And I tried to separate them up by, by months because I took, so I looked at all my October mule deer kills, what sort of mountain like aspect ratio and face and slope elevation that I killed those bucks are on. Yeah. A lot of it could be random, but there's starting to be a little bit of a trend. The more data points I get, yeah, I don't have a, you know, a shit ton of data points cause it's always mm-hmm. hard to pick up tags everywhere, but I'm starting to see trends in the terrain the type of features, the type of ridge lines, where they're facing, and I start to like yeah, extrapolate. Uh, basically, I'm extrapolating that data and looking into the units that I have tags for to try to find a better spot to go. You're into. working backwards, yep. right? You're you're taking note and data from mm-hmm. success that you've had or where you've seen deer, and you're working backwards, and, and you're starting to develop a, a picture. Yep, and that's what I do every time I go hunting. Like I don't just mark, hey, I saw a buck. I mark, hey, I saw some does. If it's a later hunt, like November, I want to know where the does are too. So mm-hmm. I start marking all the does. I start marking all the, even the elk. I want to know where elk could be because if it's an over counter elk unit, that's going to be elk pressure on that hunt. There's other elk hunters in there. So I take all, all sorts of just data points and plot them on my map and just start figuring out, okay, these are the train features. And then I, like I said, I extrapolate it to the unit right. I'm in and just try to figure out, hey, where are the water source is at? Where can people go to? to get that water and then is there a limiting factor if you go further than some of these water sources because everyone needs that water unless you want to drop all the way down the mountain and most people know most states like wyoming idaho you know water's a hard commodity to get in the mountains without are dropping you, elevation are you thinking in in, in uh, relation water specifically in relation to you having water or to mule deer having water M- mainly for me because a lot of stuff i've seen like mule deer can find ways to get water like mm-hmm. from the vegetation or the whatever they're getting it from it's like that's what you, I've seen. You know, you don't have to have like, oh, yeah, there needs to be a, a pond up here or a little seep out of the mountain. Like, they're not going to get their water from there. They're yeah. going to get their water from these remote places that we don't even know about or the vegetation. Yeah. I mean, even early, early season, you know, Utah muzzleloader, end of, uh, you know, September, early October, seems like maybe every third or fourth day, day uh, you know, a buck that I'm kind of hunting will disappear maybe for a day. And yep. I'm like, oh, I wonder where the hell he went. Maybe he's going for water, but it definitely doesn't seem to be that they're tied to water the way an antelope or an elk might be. Yeah, because that, that was like one of my questions when I was watching this this film. Because like obviously you're going into a spot you knew the water was limited, yep. and you even knew for yourself like you weren't going to have that much drinking water. Have that much water. Like I have some. And like a, a lot of people were like, if I'm going to a spot, like there needs to be water, not for just me, but for the animals. So like yep. you feel like you guys were just mentioning, like mule deer don't need as much water as maybe we would think. Not like an elk. Not like they're not tied to it like an elk is. And I mean, they'll they'll travel for water. And, and I'm like Brady. And even if there's enough, you know, if there's enough moisture and vegetation, that seems to be enough to hold a mule deer over. Where it doesn't for an elk. An elk's got to go to water. An elk's yeah. got to go to water. But a mule deer doesn't seem to be that way. And that's kind of why I harp a lot of times too. And I know Trail, like we both have biology backgrounds. Mm-hmm. That's why I feel like reading. Yeah, you can read a hunting book all day and get hunting tactics. But like the real meat and potatoes of how these animals tick, how they work, is through biology reports. And I, I cut my teeth on anything about, you know, habitat requirements, you know, feed requirements, whatever it is, water require, requirements for an animal. Like, I have so many PDF documents on my computer. I've either paid for some of these reports, mm-hmm. gotten them for free through Google Scholar, just diving through th- some things. Like, that's how you start to learn everything about the species you want to hunt. Yeah, life history. Mm-hmm. That's that stuff is, like, I think vastly underrated as far as like part of the the overall skill set of a hunter to be successful mm-hmm. year in and year out like really understanding like when an animal does what and why yeah what makes them tick yeah during what season and why they need to be there do mm-hmm. they have all the nutrition requirements that they need to survive yeah so going back to snow i mean do you like snow because like working under the thought that it's going to push deer out into the open or it's just going to be you know make them more visible i think it's both um to me they're gonna be more visible i'm gonna be able to see like some of this terrain i hunt you know it's gonna be timbered might be some burns and mm. it's gonna allow me to see into burns s- get that burns burns in, into burns All right, we can narrow it down <laughs> deer you know it's just a <laughs> common factor deer like burns so sure. you know and it's just like so you can be able to see into that terrain see into that the timber and actually see deer bedded down like that's a big at, like bonus to be able to see deer bedded because if you only see them when they're active in the morning what do you do for the next six hours in the middle of the day like you have to start you know that's why i start carrying giant optics i want to be able to pick up that shadow dissect that shadow is that an antler tine bedded down in the snow well it's gonna be a lot easier obviously if, if it's in snow rather than just dark timber with mm-hmm. green grass everywhere it is crazy how much that gray body pops, pops. off of snow yep. 
Yeah, versus just like a green or kind of a dull gray or, you know, mm -hmm. brown background of a landscape. You yeah. get that snow, it really jumps. Yeah, and if you have, you know, if it's snowing for a while, those deer are going to be bedded and also want to stop snowing, those deer have to come up and start mm -hmm. feeding a little bit. They have to start pawing the ground, get out the feed or get out the, the browse and – like that's where you're going to see him mm -hmm. at that time of year. So what was your, what was kind of your game plan? You knew snowstorm was coming. And then as in the video, you can see that you kind of hiked in quite a ways, made a camp, and then you made a different camp. Kind of yep. what was your, your game plan you had going for that? Well, I, I initially wanted to get all the way in there in one go, but it was a little bit slower. Cause we had How a many miles are we talking? A lot. Let's just put it that way. A Dou lot. Double digits? We're going to get into double digits. Yeah. Okay. So we're going in deep super deep and that's why we made that first camp and then i talked about this a little bit in the video but i want to maybe reemphasize a little bit it's the strategy of moving camp during bad weather conditions mm. so i feel it's very beneficial like in a hunt like this like my days are limited to hunting so if it's going to be a snowstorm the next day and we still have to go further i'm not going to sit around camp and just you know sit in a tent ride like this out. and ride it out like we have to be moving i want to get to my next hunting spot so when that storm breaks, breaks. i am ready to go I don't want to move during the during the day, miss all that time, move in the morning when it's actually glassing time or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we moved camp in a huge, nasty snowstorm. It was brutal. My hands were so numb, mm -hmm. frost on my beard, like just going during the snowstorm because, yeah, it's going to suck once I get to camp. We have to dig out all the snow, pitch our teepee, yeah. try to find dry firewood, but then I'm ready to go the next yeah. day. Yeah, you're I'm not wasting not good wasting hunting any time. time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I wrote that article recently – my biggest buck, I'm a thousand percent certain that I only killed that buck because I hunted the backside of a storm. Mm -hmm. I think that buck had been bedded. Yep. I think he probably hadn't got up for a day or so to feed because, you know, he doesn't want to get up in the wind and the rain and all that. And I think I think that can be really beneficial. I think those those hours right after a big storm breaks, man, they got to get up and, and move, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that buck that I killed was just totally nocturnal, you know? Yep. I think that's the only reason I ever saw that buck is because it was on the backside of a storm, so. Mm -hmm. Does that storm start, so you get you get camp set up, right? In a, yep. na in a nasty storm? Yeah, but the, well, the one big benefit of moving through that storm also is I got to see where all the other camps were. Oh. Once we kind of got up on, on this area where I was going, uh, the one water source that I had in the summer where I was getting all my water from, I knew just based kind of what I was seeing around there, like, hey, there looks like there's some old activity in here, like probably some guys on horseback coming in, some mm -hmm. horse scat and that sort of stuff. And there was one, two, three, I think it was four horse camps. So you're seeing people. Oh, yeah. So I'm getting up top. All of a sudden I start seeing, you know, wall tents. I start seeing some horses sitting there. Guys are just in their tent the whole time. I'm like, wow, they're really close to the water source. I hiked up a little further, looked down. It's one little area. Boom! There's another couple horse camps on there. Does so that like, bug you when you see people out in the field? It does, especially that deep too. Like everyone <laughs> <laughs> kills him. Yeah, it just destroy, <laughs> destroys me inside. Just, just devastates. Just like, Keep going. Yeah, and so that's like everyone has the right to be out there, but it's like you go into some of these beautiful places and you're so deep in, you just expect you're gonna be the only one there. But it's like gears lighter nowadays. Everyone else has horses. You have llamas. You have goats. Whatever it is, you can get deeper in the mountains. So like. But that's what the benefit to my strategy then was like, I was like, well, these guys are here at this water source. They have to be at this water source for their horses. Mm -hmm. There's no other water. Yeah. This, like there really isn't. I've checked it all out. Maybe they know something. They've been hunting there forever. And they don't, but like they're all camped around the water. So why am I going to also camp near them? Like I would, I wouldn't want someone to camp near me, first of all. So it's like, they're already there first. I need to go further. So sure. they want to keep going down this other area. Well, I'm going to be there first to be there earlier now. And I'll be able to sleep in longer in the morning to then pursue further distances. We're there up to wake up early, saddle their horses, feed their horses, water their horses, and then go and then come back all the time. They're going to be more tired. So the longer the hunt goes, the more benefit it is to me to be further away from them. Mm -hmm. And that's why that snowstorm was also very valuable because that was our only source of water for ourselves. And then you mentioned you saw, on one of those horses, they were packing out a pretty good deer. Oh, yeah. That, bro that made me really crazy. I, I <laughs> he was getting double whammied on this one. He saw people, and then yeah. he looked, oh, and he said, a big oh, buck. shit, there's so, a big so, buck. So where they killed that deer is actually this little ridge where I I'd sat across from there multiple times in the summer and saw some really good deer, like I think 170, 175 type bucks. They're still a long ways away because I want to book them up in the summer, but they I had seen them going on that ridge coming out, and I didn't know – at the time they had a buck and all of a sudden they came looping around through this trail system and I saw a buck back swaying. and forth on, swaying on there and it was a good deer, a big, for, big front forks, big mm -hmm. back forks. And I'm like, okay, that's probably at least one of the deer that I saw in the summer. Right. And they somehow had effectively hunted it during a storm. I think they might've just been riding their horses and maybe, you know, 
jumped it in the snow and sure. shot it like a lot you of sure classic cov- hunters yeah, go. You can Th- cover a lot of ground on a horse. Yep. And so they were doing the same thing I was doing. They were hunting during the storm as I was moving camp during the storm. So their method was really beneficial mm-hmm. just like I had to do. So. Yeah, I got to hand it to them. Mm-hmm. Being, being up and out and moving and, yep. and still hunting instead of staying in camp. So that was kind of hard to see right away, especially, you know, we just had get got to my good spot and already see one buck being taken out. It's like, ah. Oh. Mm-hmm. And this has all happened before you even really started hunting. Before we even really started hunting. <laughs> so I ran to the guys from California who said there's nothing up here. Yeah. And the cool thing is, too, I, I, I jumped over this, but those guys that said, like, oh, yeah, we saw a bunch of elk, and they're all acting weird, and we started glassing around, and they were hoping to see some wolves. Mm. And they were like, guess what we have in our backpack? And I was like, wolf? And they're like, no, we got a kitty. What? Yeah, they shot a mountain lion. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, they, take, they use their, mount, their deer tag and take a mountain lion. To tag a mountain lion. Yeah, and so they were just coming out, and they are like, yeah, it's going to be a little weird, though, because we're from California, and oh, yeah, we can't take a mountain lion back into the state. And I'm like, gosh, that state's mm. so whacked. Yeah, that oh, is yeah. weird. That does suck. So oh, like, good for them. Yeah. So they took a mountain lion out of there. That's awesome. And yeah, then ran to those elk guys, or I mean those guys who shot the deer, and just not a great start to the hunt, really. Mm-mm. And just all that snow and just low visibility. And I'm like, yeah, we've got to do some hunting here pretty soon. Like, I need to put glass on some animals. And you're hunting on your own, right? Yeah, it's I mean, just solo. It's just solo, all by yourself. All by ca- myself. Camera guy. Yep, just me and Luke the whole time. Mm-hmm. I'm grinding you out. You like hunting like that? I actually really enjoy solo. Cause I, I mean, you cut your teeth hunting solo mm-hmm. back in the day, and I did too. And it's like, until it really came to go hunt, I never really hunted with a lot of other people because mm-hmm. it's always just solo. All my thoughts are my own. All my de- decisions are my own. Strategies are my own. And it's just, yeah, it's, hunt, it's fun hunting with friends, but when you hunting solo, it's just a different mindset every single day. It's just like, today it could happen. Tomorrow it might happen. But everything I do is just because, it's you up know, to you. it's up to me. Yeah, whatever you want to go, direction you want to take your hunt. I mean, no. that's, that's all on you. Luke wasn't telling you what to do? No, Luke wasn't really telling me what I to do. I don't know, Brady. It's pretty cold out pretty today. Pretty cold. My hands are freezing. That's what I kind of like, though, about Luke. Because like, he's, he's game to do whatever we want to do. And we made some savage, savage journeys on that trip. Because as the film says, you know, we just kept going more ridges, one more ridge further, mm-hmm. just constantly in search of deer. Because there wasn't a lot of deer, which is also a little frustrating to you. Yeah, so you were you weren't seeing too much deer. No, we weren't seeing a lot of deer at Did all. Did you know that going in there that this was going to be like yeah. the deer numbers maybe aren't too high? Yeah, because I was scouting some other areas in the summer, some like mid to lower elevation stuff. As I was getting into these areas, and I wasn't seeing any deer down low, wasn't seeing any deer in mid elevation. And I really only saw deer where it was kind of hunting. And then having that one hunter pack out a deer, it's like, well, that's one of my target bucks already gone. Like I think there's only one more that actually would really be interested in taking. And all the other bucks I saw were like fork and horns, three points, and just dinkers and not a lot of numbers at all i think scouting i only saw maybe five or six bucks that doesn't deter you a little bit when you're scouting like not a lot of deer numbers it hurts but also i just think the further i go the deeper i go especially on a hunt i will find deer especially with a snowstorm like that that's why like to me i try not to get down on that it's just like i try to dig into all my experiences all my knowledge and just be like i'm just going to keep pushing every single day and eventually i'm going to find some animals like Mm-hmm. I can't switch units. I have to be here. Sure. It's like the unit I have to be stuck in. So I'm going to find an animal yeah. and just hope all my cards are the reasons I'm here is because all my previous knowledge and it's eventually going to pay off. But I just got to put that effort in. As far as habitat goes, I mean, were they, I mean, that time of year, October, what were you mostly focused in? Upper elevation, mid yeah, you know, upper el- upper elevation, tree. like all that edge habitat between the timber and some of the burned areas, and then just that's where it seemed like it was in the summer the greenest and most vegetation for them, and mm-hmm. that's where they're kind of hanging out. And like they weren't in any of these open swaths of yeah. you know hillsides, but it was just kind of that transition. But they're still up high. I mean, can't remember what the elevation was, but they're at the top of the peaks. Like mm-hmm. even some of those basins we jumped over into later in the hunt, that was just all snow everywhere, and it's just like look picture perfect for like an old you know mature deer to be hanging out we were seeing does up there so it's hmm. like if i'm seeing does still there's definitely going to be some bucks somewhere around sure. here it's not there's, like they all moved out mm-hmm. yeah so i got that feedback before like like oh yeah they're just hunting way too high it's way too much snow like i'm like hmm. i've seen some deer push some snow with their bellies before mm-hmm. late in november especially and it's like they're not going to get out of there they know yeah. it's they know it's a random snowstorm is going to melt in two weeks and it's kind of your your mo you go like, high. Go high. Just go high, man. <laughs> just go high. <laughs> That's, if you start high, man, you can just go down from there. But if you start low and just get stuck on all that low stuff, yeah, you're going to see deer. But are they the quality of deer you want to go after? Sure, there might be a big giant deer down there. Sure, there's probably going to be more people. And that's why I'd rather just go where no one wants to go. Go to the nastiest units, the hardest tags, 
where the easier tags to get are nasty places. And how much snow are we talking? Uh, I think at some point there was like maybe a foot, foot and a half oh, wow. in some areas. Yeah, and some obviously up on top in the drifted areas was quite mm-hmm. a bit of snow. But like we were post in a lot of areas, just miserable. And we reached a point too where there was no horse traffic mm-hmm. beyond a certain area. And so we basically had all these other back basins to ourselves for quite a few days. And I never yeah. saw anyone go past this point for whatever reason. Yeah. See, when this spot you picked out, you kind of figured you obviously wanted a ridge system. So I you wanted a ridge system so I can keep traveling. And I wanted a ridge that had all sorts of different you know, aspects. I wanted some east-facing slopes. You know, I wanted some, you know, north stuff, too, to kind of look into. I just wanted a lot of different terrain, a lot of smaller finger ridges to go out there. So it gave me a lot of options, even around camp. Even though you're like, oh, yeah, you're hunting from camp. Like, it's not going to be any animals here. But I'm so far in, there's still good deer habitat mm-hmm. right by camp. And so we had tons of options. Yeah, and w- once you're way up on top. You yeah, just, you can just keep going. Just walk the ridge systems. Yeah, walk the ridge systems. Different, different which places. makes it some long days too because you're having to travel around you know big canyons and stuff like that and i try to avoid dropping down and coming up but if we saw a deer you know down and up i would go down and up chase after it like yeah. i don't care how far i have to go to find a deer I'll what uh what's your day look like what's your methodology i mean are you are you getting up in the morning and then hiking all day and mm-hmm. just kind of glassing <laughs> not, not on this hunt <laughs> there's a couple times where he, i guarantee people are like i can't believe you slept in yeah <laughs> slept i even i even made fun of myself for some some mornings so like most mornings i'd wake up you know well before sunrise mm-hmm. open the tent a little bit and it was just white out okay we got snow every single day in the sun and then i just went back to sleep right away and then everyone knows I mean, you guys have hunted with me. I can Brady sleep. Brady likes to sleep. I can sleep in the mountains very easily. I always say I get better sleep in the mountains than I do at home. Brady is a world-class sleeper Yeah, out, I, out in the hills. So that did not help by seeing, and it probably was just a small storm. I probably should have just went out there, but I was like, man, it's snowing out. We're not going to be seeing anything. I'm just going to go back to bed for a little bit, and then I don't turn my alarm on. And <laughs> all of a sudden, it's like you know, 8.30 in the morning. Like, oh, shoot, now sure. the storm stopped and should have went out there. This is why Brady likes to hunt solo. It's like yeah. his sleep, probably. His own schedule. <laughs> his own yeah. schedule. Yeah, nobody up pacing around. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then I even had one morning where I think we showed that one on film that I totally forgot to set my alarm. Or it went off, and I sh- shut it off really quick. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm bad about hitting the snooze. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm not a morning person. Right. Like, I stay up till you know, midnight, mm-hmm. two in the morning a lot of times working. So, like, I need to switch that and become – I need to work out in the morning <laughs> so I'm more better prepared once hunting season Maybe comes. Maybe as you get older, it will help. You know, know. you'll just I want to be bed. one of those old guys that goes to the diner at four in the morning right. and have coffee. <laughs> Yes. With the with the town people. Yeah, goes to bed at 8 o'clock and gets up at 4. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, like trail. Right. Yeah. Want to be an old guy like trail. That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. So you, you get up in the mornings and you're basically just glassing all day long. Yeah. I love glassing. Absolutely love glassing. Like, yeah, there's a million different ways to kill bucks. I've never been the person who can find a buck track and just go track it all day. Mm-hmm. I want to eventually kill deer that way, but to me, I kill deer by optics, by using big glass. What did you pack in there for optics? So scouting, I brought my 115 and my BTX. So yeah. that's a 115 millimeter objective for those of you that might not know. It's a, a, a Swarovski. That is a giant lens. That is the eye of God. It's this big. It's big. <laughs> and it's then giant. and then the BTX, which is your your dual eyepiece. It's a set power 35. 35. Right? Yeah. So 35 set power with 115 objective. Yep. Why the 115? So the 115 to me, I was going back and forth on what to get. And I would say I've used 85s for a long time. I've used some 65s. And I thought about, yeah, maybe just getting the 95. Mm-hmm. But I was like, after talking to, you know, Cody Nelson, our optics guy, and just knowing him, him knowing my strategy, is like once you start using your 95, you're going to be glassing really far away in early morning or really far away late at night, and eventually you're going to loosen that light gathering. Sure. And you're just going to start glassing further and further. Especially with BTX, you're glassing crazy distances. So eventually you're going to probably wish you had that 115. Mm-hmm. And once, if I go with the 115 to start, I can always downgrade to like an 85 or a 65. I want to go lightweight, mm-hmm. but that 95, I'm not going to go 95 and buy a 115. Like I don't have endless cash. Like I'm not going to keep <laughs> wasting some of my money on two similar things. Mm-hmm. So buy the best and cry just once. I thought for me with, my, with me being so focused on glassing and optics, I might as well just get the biggest one possible best digiscope for filming obviously and then just be able to pick apart deer a lot easier during these low light conditions or really far away things so the btx with 35 power two eyes it feels like it's a lot more magnification 35 power Hmm. so i'm able to comfortably pick up animals at distances that you normally wouldn't be able to or even close up in timber because your eyes are you know we always have two eyes looking at everything so Mm -hmm. we're, we're naturally focused on just picking up details with two eyes open where you squint the whole time 
eventually your head starts hurting or you're not going to glass as long or hard. So it's like, to me, the two eyes things just make sense. And once you put your eyes behind a BTX and sit there for a while, you're like, holy shit, this is awesome. Yeah, it is pretty comfy. Do you take the BTX? I mean, is the type of terrain, do you do you have any kind of determination on what the terrain has to be like in order to you to justify taking a scope that that's that, that yeah, heavy? Because it is heavy. That, that's why I, ju- I I'll, I'll I'll say it right now, like I just took the BTX scouting and on the actual hunt, I took the ATX Okay. because I just didn't want to pack some more extra weight mm-hmm. and I didn't want to have to take both of them because on a filmed hunt, I want to be able to actually zoom in and get better digiscope. And so that allows me to, you know, get 70 power on mm-hmm. the ATX where the BTX is fixed mm-hmm. at 35. You're taking an ATX 85? ATX, no, the 115. Oh, okay. So I took, I still, still took the 115. Still take the 115. Yep. And then I just took the ATX because okay. I've already scouted it. Like, I don't have to glass stupid far anymore because mm-hmm. I kind of know the basin, kind of where some deer are at. But when I got up there, I did, you know, kind of regret not bringing the BTX still. Hmm. Like, I just love it. I paid for it. I probably should use it. Mm-hmm. Kind of thing, you know. <laughs> justify it. Justify use. it, yeah. Yeah. And so, like, yeah, you, some of these canyons, you know, the BTX is a little overkill, which mm-hmm. that's why I also have the 12 power binos. I love to glass off a tripod with the binos. But with that BTX, man, you can just pick up every little detail. What's your strategy for glassing? Like, as far as do you start out with your 12s on a tripod and you're making a quick scan and then going to the BTX to really like pick apart once you've kind of cleared the whole area? Is yeah, that what I, I like to I like to say probably I am, you know, in the mornings it's all 12s on a tripod, just glassing all the little details, all the stuff that's kind of close to me until you know maybe like an hour or two into the morning. I'm obviously gridding everything. I love the grid system going up and down, left and right, and trying to like picture. You know, like to me, I'm a camera guy, I like the rule of thirds, like big grids. And I like mm-hmm. to make big grids with the binos, and that way I start to memorize certain features of the terrain. And all of a sudden, I see something slightly off place. I know it's probably a deer entered it, or I can kind of pick it up because I've already glassed everything. Mm-hmm. And then once, you know, the sun starts rising up and shadows start changing, then I start picking up my spawning scope. And that's where I start doing what I call, like, my detailed work. Like, I'm really diving in with a lot of power and checking out shadows, checking out finding out bedded deer, finding, you know, the flick of a tail, a little antler tine, like a little glare off something. And then I take my grids that are a little bit bigger and I start narrowing those grids down and I just go really fine detail moving around trying to pick things up better. But it's also a really good thing too. Like you don't want to sit in one spot in glass all the time. I mean, that's what a lot of people do wrong. Like where you're sitting in glassing, if you do that for 30 minutes and all of a sudden you move like 80 yards further in glassing, mm-hmm. just a different angle mm-hmm. sometimes you can pick up things a little bit better. I mean, a lot of the times it's depending on terrain, but even if you just go down a straight line, you're glassing something a little bit differently. Right. Especially yep. solo too, because like usually if you're going to another person there yeah, yeah you got a lot more 10 money to 20 yards in there. Mm-hmm. to your right or left or up or down so mm-hmm. i remember i went on a hunt one time it was a late arizona archery hunt with a buddy and he climbed up and sat down on this peak glassed i'd move further up the ridge i'd spent probably two and a half three hours glassing hadn't picked anything up i walked down i sat maybe six feet from him and I looked over at him, and I was like, what's wrong with that buck? And he's like, what buck? And I'm like, that that buck that's like 300 yards right there. Yeah. He was he was sitting almost directly behind this small juniper, ground uh-huh. juniper. It was in, directly in line with him. That buck was bedded, I mean, directly in line with him at 300 yards and had been for, you know, a half hour. And, yeah. and I was 10 feet from him. So just, <laughs> just a different line of sight. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. ask you a question. When you're glassing a big mountain, do you go close first or further away first? Because the further away thought mm-hmm. is always like, oh, you want to catch an animal before it goes up and over a ridge, possibly. Mm-hmm. But then, like, we always run into, like, our camera guys always spot animals before us because they're always looking super close to their naked eye, and we're always looking kind of further away. It's so, like, what's that balance like for you? Yeah, I would say I, I like tens. So mm-hmm. I start out with tens, and I think my first step is to just do a quick scan. You're trying it, to find something you maybe could, if you were mm-hmm. rifle hunting, see right away and maybe yep. take? or I'll, I'll check that country that's, like, immediately in front of me. So if I'm sitting on a ridge and I've got a canyon and maybe the opposite side's five or 600 yards, I'm going to pick that apart pretty quick with my tens, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to grid it out mm-hmm. real quick. And then I'll probably spend, you know, an hour or so or, you know, however long. Just depends on, on how long I plan to be there. But I'll pick out farther distances with my tens, just looking for anything moving. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like you, once things have kind of settled in, I'm, like, satisfied that I haven't missed anything that's moving, um, I'll get a spotting scope and I'll, you know, put that to work. And I'll start actually, like, looking at individual trees. And I'm like, yeah. oh, do I see a deer behind it mm-hmm. or anything like that? And I'm picking apart. It's... It's laborious, man. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, yeah. I looked at, I've looked at everything here, you know, but yeah. that's, that's how I do it. Yeah. yeah. And there's another benefit too of the snow. We'll go back to that. It's like, do you ever do the thing where you're glassing for tracks in the snow? Yep. 
for like sure. High mountain basins, you see a fresh mm-hmm. track going across. You can kind of determine if it's a deer or elk based on kind of the size of it. And like how many the, animals there are. Yeah. 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 And so, like, I'm glassing tracks a lot, too, just trying to find the tracks and go reverse. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a major benefit at. for the, for that snow hunting. Yeah, mm-hmm. you, you turn onto a track, and you're like, huh, it's on the backside of a snow. You know there's something moving. Yeah. A lot of the times when I'm when I get tired is when I just like to look at the close stuff with my eyes. Like sometimes just looking at it with your eyes instead of looking through binoculars. Your forehead's asleep on your scope and you're just like, I'm like, oh, all right, oh. I can't look through my binoculars anymore. I'm a little <laughs> bit tired. Yep. Just like looking. It's crazy how you can actually pick up shit just by looking without like straining your eyes sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just taking a little break from the binos. So you're not seeing deer. Are you seeing deer? No, I haven't even seen a lot of deer. Not man. seeing any any real deer. Not mm-hmm. many. I, huh? think I, I think early in the hunt, saw a few does here and there. How and many it, days in are you before you're like? I mean, how many days are are you? Three days in, two days, three days before you kind of get to an area that you want to be in. Yeah, I think it was like our third day. We're finally starting to click and starting to see some deer. Okay. But like, I think that one funny part was I was like, just I was down and out for a little oh, bit. Yeah, like exactly. when I was, I was like trying to make the title of the film. Like I was like, this is just a survival film. There's, this is, <laughs> we're going to get to the hunting part later. This is, we're just showing <laughs> there you. There is no deer here. <laughs> yeah. no, no deer here. Yeah. Like that's the point where you just like, you know, obviously I'm just, you know, kind of poking fun at myself, but it's like, that's when you just got to kind of dig deep and just be like, you know, there's deer somewhere. You're crossing up all the areas or not to try to find the areas that they are. And Did you just, consider moving, like bailing and going to somewhere else completely? I didn't want to do that at all. Okay. I just hate the, I hate the thought of packing up camp, going back to my truck, and driving somewhere totally new. Because I already put all my eggs and scents in, a, in one basket in this little area. Mm-hmm. And I saw some deer there. I was like, how many deer did I miss in the summer? Because I was there in the summer, it was hot. Like, yeah. probably wasn't a lot of deer moving. There's probably a lot more deer there that I didn't see. And I was like, well, eventually, like, maybe we'll just pack up camp and go crazy further distance. Like, just go stupid deep. In your experience, so you, you scout it in the summer, which I assume is probably like July, August time frame, mm-hmm. right? And you, you're seeing deer, you're seeing some bucks that you're interested in taking. What's the time frame before you think those deer are like, you know, clearing country? Like, mm-hmm. is it, are you into like the middle of October, the end of October? Like kind of what's the, the time frame for you where you're like, if I scout this in July and there's bucks, I'm going to hunt it through what? I think to me, I factor that into what are the mountain ranges looking like around there and what does like winter habitat, how far away is pro- possibly mm-hmm. that winter transition breeding zone country. So area, area I am in, you know, based on everything I've done research wise, like I'm going to find deer in there through easily end of October, first mm-hmm. part of November if the season went that far. But like a state like, you know, maybe Colorado or Wyoming, you start getting those later stuff. I think those deer are going to start bouncing because it's just too nasty up high. And they might yeah. run out of too much snow, not enough habitat, and then they have to start, you know, dropping down a little bit lower in some of the transitional zones. But just like I think it's all mountain depending, and it's just based on previous experience. I think too, it's like a hard thing just to judge. Like, oh yeah, there's snow, like deer can be gone. Mm-hmm. You got to think it's October. Like those snow storms are going to melt. There's going to be mm-hmm. tons of vegetation underneath that. Mm-hmm. Was it yeah. snowing every single day? Yeah, everything every single day except for the day I killed and the day I, I packed out. Woof. <laughs> yeah i hate the snow i mean and i i i don't like hunting in it i mean i i just i'm not great i'm not a great rifle deer hunter i've yeah. decided like i've I've done okay over the years my my bigger bucks have all been early season muzzleloader bucks i've been lately beating my head against the wall going why do i keep going you know second and third rifle seasons when in reality i'm just more effective early you know mm-hmm. so i i hate the snow man i hate and, it and the problem was up there it was so cold that all the snow that was falling down was straight powder. Oh, yeah. And you know from experience on our oh, Colorado yeah. hunt that one year, like melting powder snow and trying to convert that into water, like you take a whole giant, you know, jet boil or MSR thing and try to melt powder snow down, you're getting water content like an inch thick. You're going through tons of fuel. <laughs> There's tons of fuel. That's why, we, that's why I utilize the, you know, the seek outside stove and mm-hmm. you put all that snow on there, set that on there for a while while you're doing some other stuff at camp, cutting wood and let that melt down. And then you'll, you know, boil that really quickly and dump that into some other snow to, like, shake that up really quick to start building that water content without having to, you know, burn up your jet boil f- mm-hmm. fuel. You were drinking snow the whole time. Snow water, yeah. Which is basically... How I, many fuel canisters did you bring? I only brought one small one the whole well, time. You, you the were using the, yeah, he's using melt, the, melt it on, the sto- on the stove. Yeah. But, like, all your water is tasting, you know, like pine needles. <laughs> it literally doesn't taste clean water. And that's when you... Pine tea. And that's what you guys know from working with me. Like, I don't drink a lot of water... To right. begin you, with your, your prayer 
You're yeah. getting ready every day. Yeah. So my thought process is. <laughs> He's just dehydrated right now. Desert rat. <laughs> yeah. So I'll explain it again right now for people who don't know. But like I swear if you live at a constant state of dehydration, which I drink coffee all day long. And at the end of the day, I'm like, wow, I didn't drink a single fucking liquid water. <laughs> Like I'm, my body's constantly being used to de- de- dehydration. So when I go up in the mountains, dehydration is just normal for me. So I don't need a lot of water on a hunt to survive. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you're training your body. I mean, training my body. There might be some struggles. science. When I played one. basketball in high school, our coach would never let us take water breaks. Makes you stronger, tougher. Yeah, that's what he always yeah. said. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't drink a lot of water either. But I know on a hunt, like, and I guess it depends on the hunt. Like, if you're camping, you're hiking a half mile, and you're glassing eight hours that day, probably don't need a ton of water, you know. Mm. But if you're hiking, and you're especially if you're hiking through a foot of snow. You're going to burn through some sweat. You're going to need to replace that water, mm-hmm. you know? And that's when I always, like, am in those situations. I'm like, damn it. When I get back home, I'm going to drink so much freaking water. I'm going <laughs> to turn that faucet on and get that water so easily. But then I come back and I never do. Did you have supplements, though, with you? Yeah, I had a bunch of Mountain Ops stuff. Yeah. And Luke had a bunch of Mountain Ops. And yeah, we were kind of making the most of the making little the most water, of the water you had. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear about your gear. So, like, you're camping in really – how cold? Uh, I think it's single digits. Teens? Yeah, no, teens. Teens. Yeah, teens maybe maybe cold. some singles. Yeah, that's cold. So as far as equipment goes, I mean, what are you using as like clothing system? What are you camping in? Sleeping bag, sleeping pad. Yep. So I just had uh, a Thermo Thermo New Air Uber Light, which is not the most you know insulating. Yeah, insulated. <laughs> and and I try to save a little bit of weight. Excellent, bud. <laughs> yeah, I try to save a little weight because uh, I get a regular instead of the long one because it's just. Lighter. Lighter. Sure. And so my feet hang off, and I can always throw something down there. But I have a Stone Glacier Chilkoot 15-degree bag, Mm -hmm. and then I have the stove. So the stove, I'm able to, you know, stay warm. And, again, my thought process is always, well, I carry all this down clothes up there. If I get cold and my 15 degrees is not enough, I'll throw some clothes on. Mm -hmm. I don't ever think you need to have a zero-degree bag in any of these hunts, especially with the stove. What do you use for a tent? Uh, Secret side Cimarron. Okay. And I think that's a perfect tent for... Me and a buddy and a stove. Mm-hmm. Like, perfect and size. Your gear, and yeah. your gear? And all your gear inside, yep. I don't put any gear outside. Getting everything inside. Yep. And so we have that every single day. And obviously, I have to have a little packable saw. It's one of those little, little, little silky mm-hmm. silky saws. Pack one of those around pretty much all day. Pyro putty is going to be your game changer or Vaseline-soaked cotton balls. Like, mm-hmm. you're going to want to carry fire starter with you all, all times. Like, there was... So many times on this hunt, I didn't really showcase it a lot in the films. I was just making random fires throughout the whole entire day to stay warm. Starting a fire. Starting a fire. Just a glass. Just a glass just right just next to the fire. Just check in with. Yep. Get, get warmed up. Get warmed up. Glass yep. and, what's, yeah. your, uh, what's your take on fires and spooking game? I don't think it's a th- thing at all. Animals know. are so used to forest fires, you know, wildfire type stuff. Like smoke is natural to them. And I think, too, it just like it kind of masks your scent. Like, there could be a random fire, whatever, and they're just used to it. Like, I don't, obviously, I think the the main part of that fire is getting an issue because you start a fire, you start talking louder. You, like, you feel like you're, mm. like, you yeah, know, back at camp campfire. somewhere. Well, like, we've you have had a some good bullshit sessions around a fire. Man. Yeah, so you start <laughs> talking louder, you start banging sticks really loud, and that's where I think you might get in trouble. But as long as you have a small fire and you're very cautious about breaking your branches and just not yeah. yelling while you're camping. I've, I've kind of had the same experiences with fire. I mean, in Wyoming... And that elk hunt out west, we had fires a ton right yeah, at our yeah, camp, and yeah. we had elk all over us. Yeah. We had elk coming by our camp, bugling by our camp, and that we was had even fire. early too. Yeah. That was September, yeah. middle of September. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But and also like in terms of clothing, you know, like you're gonna want to have a shit ton of layers. Like I had, you know, thick, full-on puffy pants, puffy jacket, you know, down mittens, the shell on the outside for you know water and stuff like that, so I don't get my down all wet and just like layering up constantly and then being able to take off all those layers when you're hiking because you start sweating in those environments mm-hmm. and you sit down and try to glass you're going to be frozen oh, and you're just get frozen worst. to the core and then you're, gonna, then you're not going to glass effectively too so the yeah. more you can be comfortable while you're glassing the more efficient you are as a glasser and that's why sometimes having that fire right next to while you're glassing is going to be a benefit i can warm my hands up really quickly and if i'm taking my hands out to digiscope or run my phone or whatever they're going to get cold and i want to be able to warm them up right away so, so you're, you're taking down mittens then down mittens the whole time yeah mm-hmm. every single day you're packing it which sucks carrying all that stuff but again it's a not a, a true late season hunt but it's also a safety thing like the further we get out there eventually maybe i kill a deer that night and you know luke's going to be standing there he's a camera guy he's not going to be cutting up meat he's not going to be warm the whole time he needs to have some down clothes as well so we can stand there while we cut up meat or maybe we get in a weird situation and we have to camp underneath the tree with a fire. Like, I'm all for that if that means killing a deer the next morning. Like, I'll stay out there all night to kill an animal. Mm-hmm. So you're taking a lot of precautions not to sweat. A lot of precautions not to sweat, yeah. So, like, you 
taking rest, walking around. Taking rest, walking around, not trying to wear my puffy pants while I'm hiking, even though I freaking really want to. Like, you're you're de-layering every single time when you're moving around. Yeah, that's yeah. so annoying with a late-season yeah. hunt. You're constantly on and off, taking the pack off, layering down, layering back up when you, you sit down. Yeah, yeah and I feel like a lot of people – just like, all right, I'm just going to hike my ass off, get over here as quick as I can. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. And they're sweating their ass off, and then they sit down. There's a little bit of a breeze. And that's why you see, too. Ice cold. Like, I'm constantly, every time I go to sit, like, I'm digging out the snow underneath the ground, trying to get down to the dirt, putting a glassing pad down, trying to keep myself a little bit insulated from that cold. Because I don't want to also get my down clothes wet, because then it's not going to, you know. Here's a question for you. This is something I do. I don't know. I, t- I kind of turned Neville. I don't know if he's adopted this or not, but. Like when I hike into an area and I know I'm going to be sweating and I'm going to sweat through a base layer, I'll typically take, I take another base layer with me mm-hmm. and I'll hike in wherever I get, you know, I've sweat through that base layer. I'll peel everything off. I'll take that wet base layer off and I'll put a dry one on and I instantly, you know, I feel warmer. And then throughout mm-hmm. the day, maybe it's that night when I get back to my tent and I have a stove, I'll try to dry that base layer out, you know, so I've got another one to rotate. Yeah. Do you do you like that method, or do you just leave your wet layer on and layer up above it and let your body heat dry it? I like to let my body heat dry it. Yeah. Or I've done before where, like, so I'll have my core lightweight hoodie, mm-hmm. and that'll be the layer that gets soaked. I'll then swap it over to my core heavyweight and just go skins, mm-hmm. but then sometimes I'll keep that one inside my jacket somewhere yep. just to kind of, like, dry that off, and then I'll switch back again to try not to get my core heavyweight wet when I'm hiking around again. Yeah. Yeah. I get really cold if I get wet. And then doesn't even doesn't seem to matter even if I layer up over that and especially it's not so bad if it's just cold but if you get some wind, mm-hmm. oh man, that wet layer on your skin with some wind just oh. yeah yeah Freak. what is the the it's like a there's a bunch of studies on like the rewarming rewarming stuff yeah and I I think you are supposed to keep it on trail way to go yeah yeah <laughs> I, what will Barclo say right now to yeah you? probably Barclo tell me to like, wear it wear it dry but, but it d- it's got to depend too on probably the fabric that you have as your base layer because obviously some are going to dry faster than others yeah some of the synthetics for merino or yeah and i'm a synthetic guy late mm-hmm. you know because yeah. it dries so much quicker wool just stays wet for me it's only dog yeah it doesn't doesn't seem to dry out nearly as quick as i need it to yeah. but yeah i just get so cold i get cold i'm a cold i'm cold all the time you yeah. Know? yeah look at me i have long skinny extremities yeah. like i, I definitely mean, get cold i'm Feet in my hands. office in my basement every day with a down puffy on you know i just get cold <laughs> so i like to peel that wet layer off but weenie <laughs> <laughs> weenie. weenie yeah what day did you shoot this deer Brady? what day are we on now you no. weren't seeing shit for how many days were you out there i think i, I killed my deer on the fifth or sixth day of the hunt. And how many days were you planning? I was planning on a full, like, eight or nine. And I told Luke ahead of time, too, like, we started putting our gear together. And like, we can't pack nine or ten days worth of food in here. We're going to go up. If we see a bunch of deer, it's going to suck. We can come back out. Maybe all of us come back out, get m- more food, we'll go back in. But partway through, I was like, we're not seeing shit. We might have to start uh, rationing things a little bit. And that's what I normally do on a lot of these, like, solo crazy hunts. Like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people heard of, like, my 2020 deer. I think I killed on... Day seven or day eight, and I had been rationing since day four. You're packing a stove, like to cook cook meal with. Yeah, you I wasn't eat? doing stoveless. Yeah, okay. I had a stove. Yep. Eating eating dinner at eating night. Eating dinner at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But all my food again, you know, I take all the peak refuel Mountain House. Mm-hmm. I take them all out of that packaging, revacuum seal it all. Sure. So I'm trying to condense all that stuff. You're not saving a lot of weight by doing that, but what I'm doing is saving bulk. Space. And then I'm even able to add maybe a little bit more food just because of mm-hmm. the bulk factor in my backpack, even though I do carry, you know, 7,900 Stone Glacier, but I'm trying to save in that bulk. Did you see any other bucks? Uh, the buck I killed was actually the first mature deer I saw the entire week, which was a really big bummer. So you saw some yearlings then? Saw a lot of yearlings. Some, some two points. And yeah. And then eventually we started running to a shit ton of elk. I never really like seeing elk on a deer hunt. <laughs> Just drives me crazy. <laughs> and uh, the cool part, too, is unfortunately we didn't have a lot of good audio of it, but I did run into a wolf pack that I was kind of hunting for several days when I was up there. Mm. Um, we kept we heard them once howling in the dark coming out, and I was like, holy crap, we got a bunch of wolves. And the next day I was like really jacked, like they have to be somewhere close to us if we're hearing them howling. They have to be in the space. And the problem with the wolf, though, every time I've hunted states with wolves, I've never been able to glass them up. I can hear them howling. Mm-hmm. Next day, they would howl in the morning. They would howl in the middle of the day. We're trying to move closer and closer to them. And uh, the wolves are honestly one of the reasons why I killed the deer I killed. Because we kept moving down this ridge system. We're like, finally, we're at the end of it. We're like, we haven't hunted near camp that much. Let's start going down some of the other smaller finger ridges. 
near camp. And that's where the wolves were as well. So like during that day, I kept hearing these wolves and we kept moving down this ridge further. I did see some deer, but saw a group of does and stuff like that. And then we're just sitting there. All of a sudden I was like, man, these wolves sound like they got further away. All of a sudden I like, could barely hear them. I think they finally went up and over and I've been peeling my, or just destroying my eyes, trying to like glass them Find up. Find the wolf. And I even had a, I even always bring a coyote howl or two and try to like mm-hmm. locate them, see if they'll like come in or whatever, but never could glass them up. But that ended up because we kept going down further and further down this ridge to a spot where I eventually killed my deer because I was like, well, we're already here. This next little ridge is, I got to lose another 400 feet, which is going to suck. So we had to come all the way back up. It's like, there's a little pocket over here that we haven't checked the whole entire time. It was totally hidden. None of these horse guys could see it from their direction. The only way you could see it if you drop down this elevation and get in a small little finger ridge. And so we just basically hiked down right to it. I sat down, pulled my binos up, and it's one of those things where instantly, like, first 30 seconds, boom, you got a deer. Mm-hmm. You glassing off a tripod at that point, or you just I think, pull I think your I, binos out? I think I had my tripod down at first and already had it on there, but it was, like, literally, like, you set your binos up on the on adapter, and, like, whatever you look through first, like, boom, there's a deer. How far? Shooting distance, right away. It was... 5 580 590 okay which so is which is well within my range i know people give me shit about it but like i can shoot that all day long that's that's a hundred yard shot to me that's sure. super close and this spot was right by camp and you haven't been there yet yeah it's still probably two miles from camp maybe but drop low elevation like a little bit lower elevation down ridge but it's an area we've never touched yet the whole entire time because we kept going further and further and further one more ridge over I mean, this is one more ridge away from camp that we never checked out was this like in the morning you were going to that spot or you got up in the morning? Got up in the, got up in the morning, started like working down these areas, saw those does, and then started hearing all those wolves howling. And so we kept trying to drop elevation because that's where the wolves were. It was all the elk were as well. Right. And so like, man, it sounds like they're down on this bottom. Like maybe they had to kill down there. And that's why I kept dropping lower on this finger ridge. But then I was suddenly looking at the map. I was like, well, there's a little hidden pocket here that kind of looks like it's protected. Kind of looks like it probably has a bunch of good habitat on it. And again, it was the same sort of slope or same sort of mountain face that I killed all my bucks on. I'm not going to say exactly what type of face that is right now, but <laughs> so it's the same one I always see deer on. You were essentially hunting wolves, following the wolves, and then yeah. you ran into this pocket. You thought, all right, I'm going to glass yeah, it. Yeah, we have to, we have to, even though it was like the lower elevation, like we're going to go down there and check out that little pocket because we're here and we got to check it out. So was this buck down in a canyon? He was down in the canyon, yep. And he was just right there. I pulled on my and I was, boom, there he is. And I'm like, holy crap. And I pull up my range finder right away. I was like, shit, we can, I can take this deer right now. Like, it's one of those spots where you're on your glassing dive killing a deer, which doesn't happen very often. They had no stock at all involved. Just at the right point, at the right time. He was up on his feet. He was on his feet at like three something in the afternoon. Hmm. Just feeding. And it was one of those things too, like, after I figured out I could actually shoot him, all I had to do was move five feet over slowly started taking off the gun sleeve off my off my rifle set it all down got the bipod getting ready to kill it and obviously it's that point too where you're communicating with the camera guy are you on him am i on him i thought you know i could take a shot but he's like no i'm not on it right now and of course then the deer goes behind a tree mm-hmm. and it's one of those things where i'm sitting there for i don't know what it was it might have been only like five minutes but it felt like it was like a half hour this deer just right behind a tree i can see part of his vitals but it's like a, this big branch coming out like i have no shot forever and I'm like, if he keeps coming further and further towards us, eventually I'm going to lose him behind this little cut. Mm. And so he's on this little bench, but if he keeps coming towards me, I'll lose him just for the topography lies. And so that was really stressful. <laughs> and I'm just laying there, like, he's one of those things where your neck starts hurting, and I'm just, like, fully calm, just, like, sitting in the gun, you know, looking at him, zooming in, zooming out, rearranging it to make sure I'm fully mm-hmm. dialed, ranging spots around there in case things go haywire. But, like, everything points to I'll kill his deer as long as he moves away from that that sure Stump. are you uh what's your shot i mean we talk a lot about shot process with the bow but what's your shot process with the rifle i mean do you do you leave your scope on 20 is it 25 power yeah i max it so all you max out. that yes. thing out yep. um are you i mean do you know your weapon i know you know your weapon very well you're making the clicks yep uh, so in this situation since i knew where the deer was and uh, i knew roughly what the wind is just based on knowledge out there i didn't actually pull out my kestrel this mm-hmm. time i didn't actually measure the wind but i knew at this distance i'd have a little bit of spin drift going on because my barrel's right twist so i had to correct it to left a little bit so i actually dialed um my windage on my scope so i could still hold center because i mm-hmm. always feel like to me it's kind of like with any sort of natural point of aim like where my crosshairs are on my rifle scope if i know i have to hold left or right on there eventually i might forget that in my head because my my 
my mind and everything wants to hold direct your, center on your that crosshair. Your default is to put that on the shoulder. On the shoulder. So I, it feels uncomfortable to move that crosshair left or right to hold. Even though I have those minutes of angle left or right, sometimes I like to dial and hold dead center because to me it just makes me more zoned in. But then you have to realize that what's going on too in case you miss that first shot or something like that to have to recorrect and know that you're already dialed over so I'd you have to have time behind your weapon yeah i mean you got to know and it's just the way i yeah. do it like there's yeah. obviously other ways to do it and you could just hold over or hold to left or right but it's like i dialed dialed my windage dialed my elevation and mm-hmm. i'm just on the gun mm-hmm. just ready to go ready for this one moment <laughs> then he stepped out then he stepped out and bam let him have it i always <laughs> aim i always aim high shoulder and everything i will put it in the shoulder i know my weapon i know it's my bullet i know it's capable of breaking shoulder on a deer it's a 300 300 that was a 300 wind mag mm-hmm. yep, and i was shooting 215 grain burger target hybrids so target bullets but they are devastating on animals mm-hmm. fully under, fully know that fully tested it my whole family's been using them they work great so i know my weapon know everything this deer is literally just waiting for his, <laughs> waiting his time right dead now dead man walking <laughs> dead buck walking yeah. it's, it's it's crazy to say but it's like i feel so like in the zone when i'm behind a rifle scope like if i just dial my scope and i'm laying down i know that animal's dead mm-hmm. like i shoot so much that i'm so comfortable when i get behind a rifle that i'm like okay this is just i just need to do my thing just all my posture's right my mm-hmm. body position's in the right spot like my breathing is totally controlled like yeah, I'm kind of antsy at first when I see an animal, like everyone is. Your heart starts racing a little bit, so I'm trying to control that. I'm trying to just like deep, deep breath, trying to control my breathing, trying to control my excitement, and just realize everything I've done this whole entire week comes down to this one moment. Like, this is it. Mm-hmm. Haven't seen any other deer. Yeah. <laughs> this is the only mature buck we've seen the whole time. This is all we got. <laughs> has to happen. And it's a you know, 580 or 590 yard shot. It's a good poke. Yeah. So That's everything has to be perfect. Yeah. Everything just has to be dialed. I had the perfect rest. I had the, you know, rugged red rear support in the back of the rifle. That rifle, I always, like, dig the bipod in there. Like, my gun is set. I can just basically, like, pull the trigger and not be behind it. I could probably mm-hmm. still kill that animal because it's, like, I try to set my weapon up perfectly, level everything down, mm-hmm. and just wait it out. Pure elation when he goes down? Oh, man. Re- just relief? Just, I'm an, I, I am an emotional wreck after I kill an animal. I always am. And it's never going to go away. And people are like, oh, yeah, like... Like, what's the big deal about that? But it's like all that effort just, whew, it's like floods. You just win an NBA championship, you know, and you just like can't help yourself. But like just everything just goes crazy. You don't know what you're saying. You don't know what you're thinking. Like, you said you almost cried in this one. Yeah, I almost and cried. Video, he's like, I almost cried right here. Because <laughs> like I just love being in that position. And like I said, the adventure and the struggle is almost more to it than the size of an animal a lot of times. Yeah. Because all this comes at you and it's like, I always just think back all the times of like my dad hunting, like that's the first person I want to tell when I kill an animal. It's like, I always wish he was there with me because I've learned everything from him. So it's just like an emotional rush of like hunting with my family, you know, talking to my brothers, like bring my animal back to my mom. It's like everything all in that sense is just like, Phew. like what just happened? Yeah. It's a year's worth of anticipation. Yeah. I'd, you know, I'd pick the tag up, do a lot of scouting, everything. I have a camera guy here. Like a lot of it's riding on, you know, having a good hunt and this is the one opportunity and, boom capitalize on well, that it. and just personally it means so much to you i mean mm-hmm. this is the thing that you are into yep you i know? don't do anything else in my life i yeah, quit yeah. all the other hobbies <laughs> like all i do is chase mule deer like it's all i ever wanted it's, it's all the I think thing about. that you value mm-hmm. the, the highest that's cool and mule, so yeah mule deer I, jesus mule deer <laughs> jesus. yeah like cody boar likes to call me mule deer jesus <laughs> The hair, it, the beard. He says he's going to make a shirt about that it's, someday. It's a vibe. Yeah. yeah. And we're flip-flops, long hair. How was it getting over to recover it? Oh, buddy. <laughs> you had to go down a big That hill canyon? was so freaking steep when I got down in there. And I was like, after you get down, down in there, too, start looking around. And that's where, like, right away I'm starting to collect data. Mm. So I marked instantly where I took that shot from on my on Go Hunt Maps. I mark a little shot icon, and then once I get down there, I mark instantly where that kill location is. That's that data for later. But as I'm going down in there, I'm like, I can see why there was a deer here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the snow started melting in that area, which he was obviously probably there the whole entire time. But there was a lot of feed there. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of good, a lot of good browse, a lot of cover. Um, everything, had, everything he needed was right there. He had probably been there the whole entire week. Out of the wind. Out of the wind. Out of everything. Kind of a hidden pocket. So like, even I was hunting areas, you know, that I thought would be deer, above but, him. Yep, mm-hmm. above him the whole time. But this was just his little zone, his little pocket of he had everything he needed to live right there. Right. Yeah. And like the place he piled up in, like literally, we had to take a big log and put it next to him so he wouldn't continue to roll down the mountain. Mm-hmm. Like I'm cutting him up. It was that steep where like 
if you let go, he would just go. He'd be gone. Yeah. He just. And he's a cool buck. He is. Yeah, he's goofy. Crazy looking. Like crazy when I first saw buck. when I first saw him, I was like, dude, he's got like a big dropper off his front beam or like the swoop down beams and like. You know, he has that little Captain Hook thing going up and just old and yeah. you know, his teeth are way worn down, big Roman nose on him, scars on his face. And not a scory deer by any means, but just a cool, cool mountain buck. Yeah. His beam kind of comes out and flattens. Yeah, t- flattens, t- has some weird, weird the mass end. on the end, yeah. a bunch of acorns on top. Yeah, like, good good mass. Mm-hmm. Teeth, teeth, he's old? Yeah, he's really old, old deer. Old buck. Yeah. Which is what I, you know, I, I sure, vision, you know, shooting a big giant deer, but it's like I'll take an old mature deer in that terrain and mm-hmm. all day long and just like... So I killed him, I think, at 4 o'clock. And, I, of course, we took a lot of photos, cutting up all the meat. You know, I deboned everything right there. So I took a while, cut the, cut the cape for a mount, you know, cut all the way back to the top of his head, didn't skull cap him <laughs> at the time yet. <laughs> I know you're a big skull Did cap guy. Did you skull guy. cap him later? Yeah, I skull cap him Hell later. Hell yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah, just for you, Trail. Skull cap him. I, so I, thought, I always thought of Trail every time I skull cap an animal. <laughs> yes. Which yeah. is what's benefit of having a saw with you for yeah, cutting wood because yes. like, I want to get rid of all that weight. But yeah, uh, yeah. So that pack out though, I think right away I got all that meat loaded up and I looked at Luke and I was like, "Holy fuck, <laughs> this is gonna suck." It's like, Luke, can you take my spotter? Because you gotta go back up to camp. You have to go back up to camp. You're and there for just, the night. It's just straight going up. out's no option. Cause it's gonna suck. Okay. Yeah. So we have to go back to camp, and I only made it maybe like. I don't know, 10, 15 yards up the mountain, had to take a break instantly. Like, mm-hmm. this thing just sucks. Just straight up. Because, like, you know, I have all the, like, late season gear on, so I have all right. my down pants, yeah. all my down jackets, everything in the pack. And, like I said, I had a 115 with an ATX scope. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a lot of weight, and that's why I gave that thing to Luke. It's like, Luke, can you uh, carry take some this. of my stuff for me mm-hmm. to make it a little easier? And so I was just taking break after break. And this is one of the things, too, where I've kind of learned and kind of taken some advice from my dad. Like, I don't want to blow up my body. Mm-hmm. So even though I know I probably physically could just keep going, I'm going to take more breaks than I need to because I want to continue to hunt. I don't want to go up so hard and so heavy and so fast that I end up doing something stupid where I'm fatigued and I slip and twist an ankle, twist a knee. Blow a knee out. Because yeah. I want to hunt injured. the rest of my life. Right. Man, it only takes once. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so all those times when I load up really heavy, I just think like, okay, I need to get out of here. I need to get out of here safely. I need to do this smart, and we're just going to take a million breaks. I have nothing to do. There's no rush to get right. to camp right now. Why would I want to bust my balls to get all the way up there? Just to go to bed. Like we're, I'm, so, I'm also soaking in the moment. Like every time I sit down, you know, I lean back and I like look to the side, see that rack. It's like, this is why I'm here right now mm-hmm. for this one moment. There's no one I have to talk to, no one I have to do anything with. It's like just soak up this moment and get back to camp eventually. Yeah. So we took a million breaks going up. Got back to camp. I think it was 1230 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And the whole entire time we were hiking up, we were like, dude, I just can't wait to have some back straps over fire yeah. in the morning. Like that's all I wanted to do was just eat the entire deer. <laughs> like, just eat the whole just fucking thing. Just gorge yourself the next day. <laughs> there is something to be said. Like, I'll, I'll say it. Like, <laughs> I've had some good steak in my life. Yeah. Like, good restaurant steak. You know, I made some good steaks at home. The, the steaks you have on the mountain, nothing will compare to that. I had no seasoning. I just, you know, blackened it a little bit on the fire, medium rare on a stick that you cut, butterfly it, fold it over, burn the shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's raw, like basically really rare in the middle. And yeah. Steak, that, that, that steak to me is literally the best steak I've ever eaten in my life when you do something like that. Less than 24 hours later after you kill a deer. Oh, it's wow. different, doesn't it? It's, it's, be, it's the freshest. Dude. The like, freshest. You don't, you don't ever eat meat that fresh. Mm-mm. Everything out there in the woods tastes better. Oh, I mean, yeah. a yeah. Snickers bar on day six when you haven't had any chocolate is like the best Snickers bar you've <laughs> had in your whole life. It's the same thing. You kill an animal. Yep. You know, you get back to camp and you got a chance to like – relish the experience and sit with it and you know mm-hmm. eat some of it it does it, it definitely it feels different tastes tastes better for sure but at the same time though doing some of that stuff came back to like haunt us a little bit because like got back so late at twelve thirty, you know we're tired we're doing all this you know we made some food that night kind of slept in in the morning because like yeah we don't have anything to do mm-hmm. and then once you wake up it's finally sunny out so we're like kind of soaking it in soaking all the scenery around us like wow that was a you know really cool hunt and all that cooking all the back straps up eating a bunch of meat, just hanging in camp. Finally, like, yeah, we should, we should really start packing up and getting out of here because it started hitting me like, wow, we have a long freaking way to go to get out. <laughs> and it's going to be heavy because now we throw all the gear on. Yeah. And we're trying to split up gear to try to make it so we both can do it. And just, yeah, again, taking a million breaks, taking a million rests. And uh, as I was going down, um, I was really like, wow, it's going to be freaking dark out by the time we get out of here. Mm-hmm. So now we're hiking in the dark again. 
and now so shit's melting so there's a lot of areas that are really slick and really, really muddy, nasty yeah. and muddy and just like but again i have nowhere to be so we can take it to take our time but it's like how long did it take you to hike out forever hours i think we got back i don't know nine or ten that night and you left uh i don't know what time we left we left probably around like noon or something you stayed that night at, at uh, the trucks or did you no we started driving pill, right away pill out. Mm-hmm. and that's a funny story too so i wish we could capture it in this on film so every time i'm driving home it's late at night we're in podunk towns mm-hmm. nothing's open yeah nothing's open there's not a gas station that's opening you'll get any sort of drink so luke had this thought process i he's a genius all these gas stations were closed all we wanted to do was have a mountain dew like i don't drink pop at all sure. but i wanted a mountain dew so bad <laughs> all we had was water we had i had no gatorade in the truck that's mm-hmm. another failure on my part i had nothing like in a cooler like yeah. i had two coolers that had ice in it we didn't put any, any drinks yeah, in leave, there. Leave some beverages leave in some the some truck. Leave some beverages. Mm-hmm. So Luke had this idea. We finally got to a town where everything was closed down. But it's like, hey, there's a motel over here. It's like the vending machine. Vending machine in the motel. Mm-hmm. I had never thought of that before. Vending we walked machine. in like we owned the place. So like we had a room. <laughs> we literally had to go down the hallway, upstairs, couldn't find it. Finally, it was like this weird little area. And then we get over there, and it's like the credit card machine was broken. <sighs> Got it. So I had to go back to my truck. I had to find some like coins I had or some dollars. And then we had to go get those dollars converted at the front desk <laughs> to quarters. And we're not even staying there. And I'm like, uh, I hope we don't realize we're not staying here. We're trying to get some food. Starving. Uh. <laughs> so, yeah. And then we kept driving constantly. And then finally we hit some places where we actually should have some food. And then these like shitty fast food places were also closed for some stupid reason. And it was like one, two in the morning. We were driving back. All we wanted was some dirty food. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Like you, you leave a hunt. I've had hunts like that too, where I've got out of the back country and I've hit every fast food joint on the way home. Oh, I mean, yeah. 10 yeah. hour drive, I'll probably hit five different spots and every one of them was good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love it. Just love every yeah. single second of it. My whole truck seats are dirty you know, I'm just like, oh, it's, it's all worth it. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. That's incredible. So it was a, it was a wild ride. I mean, I just want to go hunting now. I know, yeah. right? Every yeah. time we do one of this, I'm like, me uh, too. I'm like, is it ready? Is it honey? What time season? of year is it? Yeah. You know, it's, and you it's, got, you got another Idaho tag this year. Did I? I don't know if he did. Did he? Yeah. Yeah, he yeah, did. I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> He's going back. I'm going back. You're going to do the same kind of way the hell in there. Yep. Again, like that struggle, like that adventure, just like the, you know, like testing myself. And there's just so many cool places out. Like, that's what I was like, why don't you go do different things? Why don't you do that? But it's like, there's so many different mountain ranges I can go to. There's so many different cool places in the lower 48 that I just want to explore. I want to hunt mule deer in every single state. Mm-hmm. Every time you hunt a new unit, I always I always feel this way. I always think, man, so many different cool areas that I'll never get to hunt. You yep. start looking at a map after you get home from one of those hunts, and you're like, what about that spot? What about that area? What about that area? And there's just mm-hmm. there's never going to be enough falls to accommodate at all. No. Everything just makes me so excited for the following year. Like I already know, you know, I have my tags. So I'm already e scouting. I'm already getting jacked on. I'm already like, when can I take some vacation? And like you were talking about the other day, like how much time can we go scouting because of gas prices? Like can we afford to actually go scouting this summer, like to boot boots on the ground? Like I tell you what, I give all these thought processes. I give my left one for some cheaper gas prices (laughs) right now, just just for the ability (laughs) to. I mean, you you put a great tag in your pocket. I've got a great tag, and I just want to be out there. And I hate the fact that in the back of my mind, I'm going, man, it's going to be a hundred and. 80 bucks or something you know every time i want to drive out there on a weekend and that's cheap i mean that's that's cheaper than you know like you're going to idaho that's a whole that's a long another tax bracket yeah Yeah. Yeah, if you haven't if you haven't checked out the film it's on our go hunt youtube channel one more ridge brady suffer fest adventure yep suffer fest and like always if anyone has any sort of questions there's not a wrong question at all about gear about why i do things i do definitely let me know there's so many different ways to get a hold of me either on there on the article on the website like we're happy to mm-hmm. you know talk through tactics and stuff like that and yeah for sure and then we're also doing a giveaway for this film so check that out the giveaway get entered to win and well best done of luck. best of luck this hunting season it's fun rip boys again I, I like our podcast studio so much <laughs> I love it. It's it's good. It's vibes. not as hot in here as it usually is. It's not. Is. Yeah. I think they turned the AC on today. Thank God. Come yeah. On. Yeah. We need to get some like stuff hung up in here, maybe some Chinese lanterns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some lanterns actually might be kind of nice. <laughs> like one single lantern. We yeah. could do it at night in here. Yeah. yeah. The old Campos Crush light. Yeah. Yes. We could uh, kill all the lights and hang some lanterns from the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Ambiance. 
mm-hmm. gets the conversation flowing. Need it. Yeah, love it. I appreciate you boys jumping on, talking about my hunt. Yeah, well love done. It. I'm excited love to it. see how this year goes. Yes, we'll do it again. We'll do it again in a year. Booyah. Yeah.